A Russian scientist is hoping to edit human genes in order to prevent the HIV virus or genetic deafness from being passed on to children. Scientists, however, consider this to be a little unethical. Joining me now to discuss this from Covina, California, a little bit further, is molecular biologist Dr. Anjanette Roberts, a research scholar with reasons to believe. Anjanette, welcome back to BCN. Thank you, Hal. Good to be here. Now, can you explain what is involved with this new gene editing technique? So this new technique has been around since about 2013. It was discovered in 2012. And uh, it's actually a, a set of molecular tools that allows us to target the genome in a particular sequence. So if we know the sequence of something's DNA, we can look for a particular sequence and we can create the tools to target that sequence and change that sequence in a way that can introduce a function or restore a function. So before we delve in a little deeper to this uh, Russian scientist, Denis Rebrikov, and this proposal, I wonder if we can travel back a little bit in time here, because this comes after a Chinese scientist last year claimed to have created twins from edited embryos. Did we ever find out if he was in fact successful? Well, I think the international scientific community believes that he actually did what he said he did. Uh, and so he has uh, twin girls that have had a protein that's used for HIV to enter cells edited in their genome, and he did it when they were a zygote or a very uh, small portion of an embryo, and so he was able to target all of their cells. So there's a, a lot of reasons why he probably hasn't made them resistant to HIV, uh, and perhaps he's created other problems for them down the line by altering this protein, but that was his intent, and we believe he was successful in what he said he did, and he actually claims to have altered a third embryo as well, uh, who is probably born at this point in time, because the time that he announced it, uh, the time that it takes for full-term delivery, we are just now reaching 42 weeks after that announcement. So there's probably three individuals in China that are bearing a mutation in their entire body uh, that was changed due to this man's intervention. Okay, let's go back and chat a bit about uh, the Russian biologist, Denis Rebrikov. Give me a little bit of background story on the scientist and why does he feel justified in editing human genes? Right, so it seems to me that uh, Denis Rebrikov works for the Kulikov uh, Medical Research Center in Moscow. And he, like the other gentlemen in China, uh, work in an in vitro fertilization clinic type setting at least part of the time. And so he comes in contact with women who are trying to have children, but he also feels like we ought to be using this technology to prevent disease either like HIV, or in his case, he also wants to target a protein that leads to deafness if both parents are deaf. Uh, it's, it's a particular protein that both copies in their chromosomes have to have the mutation. So it's called autosomal recessive. If it's recessive, you have to have alterations in both copies of your chromosomes. The father's deaf, the mother's deaf, that means they all, all the chromosomes have that mutation. So if they're going to reproduce, they will 100% of the time have a child with hearing impediment. And so he wants to try and target that gene so that those couples can have hearing children. Now this may sound a little bit harsh here, Anjanette, but is this actually a compelling need to have children who hear? Because deafness is not really a life-threatening disorder. That's absolutely right. Deafness is not a life-threatening uh, threatening disease. And so um, it's not even a disease for many people. It, there is a deaf culture that is very rich and vibrant, at least here in the United States. It's possibly different in Russia, but um, yes, it's, it's definitely not a life-threatening impediment. Uh, and so to target something like that, really there isn't a driving, compelling necessity to try and help change that so that those children can have quality of life. Now, if the experiment, in fact, does work, then, of course, you'll have some happy couples who have children who can hear. Now, some would see this as a major victory. How do you see it? Well, I, I think it's a complex situation. Um, the couple can't reproduce naturally. They actually have to use the in vitro fertilization route. Uh, and so that means they're going to be creating embryos, and only some of those embryos will probably be implanted, so it raises that issue. Uh, many people who are deaf, who have hearing children uh, naturally, they, they realize that there's a, a cultural difference that takes place between the, the parents and the children. And so it can create tensions in the home that aren't exactly uh, what the parents 
might have desired if they knew how it was going to play out. I mean, certainly some parents would be very happy to have a hearing child. Some deaf parents would prefer to have a deaf child. So it really is an individual choice at that point. Um, I think the biggest complex issue here is that to make these kinds of changes at a germline level absolutely necessitates that somebody go through the in vitro fertilization process. And so we're not talking about natural births. Now, is it true that changes to an embryo would be inherited by future generations? Let's say an unintended mutation affected the entire gene pool. That's right. It could very well affect all subsequent descendants of the individuals who have this type of alter alteration done uh, to them, right? So the zygote in the in vitro fertilization process, if it reaches full term, if a child's born, if the child's healthy and they reach reproductive age, all of their offspring and all of their offspring's offspring will have that, that edit also in their genomes. Now, one of the ethical issues, of course, is if the unborn embryos, you know, did not and could not consent to this. So if something were to go very wrong, it would affect real people's lives. Your thoughts on that? It absolutely would affect real people's lives. And that's one of the reasons why the majority of the international scientific community is calling on, for a moratorium uh, on this type of research. Because the, the technique, although it can target a very specific site, it, we don't know that it's only targeting that site. And especially when you're talking about something that's in the embryonic formative stage of the zygote, if you use sort of a, a laboratory representation of that type of a cell and you try and make these types of changes using this gene editing tool in those types of cells, what you find is in those cells you have more what they call off-target hits. So you may be correcting the gene that you want to correct, but you're also hitting other targets that aren't intended. And, and so that's really risky, especially when you're talking about doing that in an, in an embryo at the zygotic state. So what do you say to ethicists who believe that if gene editing is one day shown to be safe, there would then be a moral imperative to use it to prevent conditions such as deafness? Yes, I don't, I don't think that there will ever be, well, I guess we help set what moral standards are, ethical standards are for our society, but I, I don't think there should ever be a moral imperative that says that parents must undergo in vitro fertilization if they want to have children. And if the only way they can have children through natural processes results in a child that might have an impediment like the deafness mutation that, that Dr. Rubrikoff wants to target, then I would say that there's no way we should, as, as a society, should ever accept that type of language that there should be that type of moral imperative. So, Anjanette, if gene editing proves to be safe down the road, should we really be concerned that this could lead to some nations attempting to create designer babies? I'm thinking of, like, more Captain Americas. Remember that movie? Yes, absolutely. I actually enjoyed that movie. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, we have to learn a lot more before we'll ever be able to fully affect complex behaviors uh, at, a, at an adult level uh, by doing this type of intervention. It's much more likely that we'll target diseases that are, that are really life-threatening and that are simple to target because they're related to only one gene. So many blood, blood disorders or things like um, Tay-Sachs, it might be worth targeting HIV, but we'd have to target at least two different proteins. And what we're learning by this scientist's uh, work in China is that the edits that he's made might have unforeseen consequences. They might protect from HIV, but they might make the children more susceptible to other virus diseases. Because like many proteins in our bodies, they don't just have a single function. They have multiple functions. And the, the target for the deafness gene that the doctor in Russia wants to, wants to manipulate actually has six different names in the literature. And if we mess around with that protein, it's also associated with skin disorders, the protein's also found in neurological tissue. And so we don't know when CRISPR goes in and targets, even if it's targeting the right target and only that target, what it's doing is it's causing a couple of nicks in the DNA and those nicks have to be repaired. And they're repaired through normal cellular processes, but those processes are also imprecise. So even in the process of making repair and making the change that you wanna make, you can introduce other changes that you don't intend to introduce. How about eliminating maybe a cancer gene or maybe heart disease, which is also very prominent here in North America? 
Absolutely. Uh, and I think that those would make more sense. But again, heart disease is often linked to lifestyle. And so if we just made the right lifestyle choices, we wouldn't be as susceptible to those diseases. But cancer, that's a big one too. And there's so many forms of cancer. Leukemia, breast cancer, prostate cancer, brain cancer, skin cancer, the list goes on and on, right? So those, those diseases might be able to be effectively targeted by not targeting germline, but by targeting what's called somatic cells, adult cells, uh, wait until the, the person's born, wait until the disease is either detected or wait until the, the genes that lead to the disease uh, are detected and then intervene in an adult stage. And then you're not affecting subsequent generations without unforeseen consequences. So what are your thoughts on where this is really headed? Where will we be 10 years from now when it comes to DNA editing? Yeah, so 10 years from now, I think, I think we'll be using this tool in some really smart ways in, in agriculture and nature, I hope. Uh, I hope we use it with uh, a modicum of humility, though, and we don't just create gene drives where we're wiping out entire species. Um, but I, I think that there will be some really fantastic applications in this, even in the course of treating human disease. But I don't think that as a society or as a global society, that we should be monkeying around with the, with the germline, not for a long time to come, not until we can actually decide which diseases are worth the risk and we can minimize the risks to the point where we know we're only hitting the targets that we want. Now you mentioned monkeying around, how about our pets? Maybe helping out our dogs, cats, and monkeys. Yes, I, I suppose the wealthy will be able to take those approaches. <laughs> Dr. Anjanette Roberts, molecular biologist with reasons to believe. Thanks for joining me today from Covina, California. Thank you, Hal.